people saw Jesus and asked, Who is this? In worship, we declare, Jesus, Jesus is a miracle worker and healer. Jesus is a teacher and preacher. Jesus is our light in the darkness. Jesus is our source of love. Jesus is our path into the wilderness. So may we lay down our hearts like they lay down their coats. Let us worship Holy God. Monday, Cable's turn. The readers may return to their seats. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. I come here every Monday morning. It's always been like this, at least for as long as I can remember. My parents talk about a time when this room used to be packed with people here to pray and to hear the Torah every week. They talk about those days like they were glory days, if only we could get back to that. Now? Now the temple is primarily a marketplace. I come here every week for the farmer's market to buy eggs and figs and food for my family, and they have the best bread. I've never felt guilty that, about that because I pray on my own. And we still celebrate Passover, so is it really that big a deal? I used to think not, but that day changed when Jesus showed up. I don't know that I will ever forget that day. I just bartered with Samuel down the street to get two fresh fish for my kids. That's when I heard the sound. It was so loud. A crash, splintering. For a brief moment, I thought God might be tearing open the walls of the temple and climbing inside. I turned around, hands full of fish, to see the money changers' tables turned over and doves flapping wildly in their cages. Coins slowly roll their way across the holiest of holies, and everyone froze. I never heard a silence so loud. Jesus paused and looked at the room. Quietly, he said, My house is to be called a house of prayer, prayer for all nations. In the quiet, I felt myself hiding the two fish in my hands behind my back like Adam and Eve hid behind leaves, wishing the coins in my hands would disappear. And then, as quickly as he arrived, he turned and left. I can't be sure, but it looked like there might have been a tear running down his cheek. And just for a second, I wondered to myself, maybe, just maybe, that, was the, that sound really was God tearing open the walls of the temple and climbing inside. Who is he, you ask? I'm not sure. But he's not like me. He's faithful. He's honest. There was nothing hiding behind his back. Have any of you ever felt that kind of shame? Have any of you ever wanted to hide something from God? It's a good thing we don't have to. Confess with me. God, for all things we try to hide from you, forgive us.
When he entered the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Do you know how many laws are in the Torah? 613. You know how I know that? Because I spent my entire youth memorizing them, hours upon hours upon hours of repetition. And after I mastered those, I went on to memorize the entire Torah. So that's the first five books of the Bible, by the way. I spent all those hours sitting at the foot of my teacher so that I, so that I could one day teach. That's what faithfulness, sacrifice, and a life of service looks like. At least, that's what I've been taught. I've talked to every scribe and priest in the land, and no one knows who taught this Jesus. No one raised him to teach. No one even knows if he passed the Torah comprehension exam. Where does he get his authority from? And why are people listening to him? That is the thing that blows me away. His teachings are unorthodox. He's healed the Sabbath. He's talked to Samaritans, total weirdos, if you ask me. He's completely disregarded our societal lines, befriending women and others. Does he even know how many rules he's breaking? I just don't understand. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. I studied for so long, and nothing prepared me for this. What, he, what is he, you ask? He's a radical. A heretic. A rebel. A mystery. Wednesday morning, anointed. Now while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry. And they said, why this place? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble this woman? She has performed a good service for me, for you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has been done will be told in remembrance of her. It was Wednesday. I heard he was coming to Bethany. People talk about stuff like that. People also talk when you break open a bottle of perfume to anoint someone in a crowd. I learned that the hard way. In a few years, they may forget my name, but I bet they'll remember what I did. I'm the woman who anointed Jesus, and it remains one of the moments of my life that I am most proud of. Jesus was at Simon's house. He often went there when he was in the city, and I knew that. We all knew that, because we could see them packed in there. It's hard to miss 12 people packed into a room. <coughs> so before the sun fell, I grabbed my jar of perfume, the only item of wealth I owned, and I walked to Simon's. I had begged and saved for years to afford that jar of perfume. It was my backup plan my safety net, when I could no longer work, so I kept it hidden in a cupboard of my house. The whole way to Simon's house, I clutched that jar like a mother holds a baby, terrified that it might slip from my hands too soon, that I might lose the only gift I had to give, accidentally anointing the dirt at my feet instead of the man who had healed so many. It wasn't until I walked through the door and saw Jesus sitting there 
that I was able to release my foot on that jar. I had made it. I had my gift, and this was my moment. The smell was unbelievable, sweet like milk and honey, but even stronger than fresh baked bread. I knew when I cracked open that jar, it would be overpowering. It would send people into the streets, but I had to do it. People criticized me for wasting that perfume, but they don't know the whole story. They don't know what it meant to be seen and called by name by Jesus. Jesus pulled me out of the wilderness of my own isolation. They have no idea the healing that Jesus offered me, and they probably could never understand what I would give to do it all over again. I mean, how do you put a price tag on life? On a full and abundant life? I don't need everyone to understand. I just needed him to understand. He gave me the gift of new life. So in return, I gave him the only thing I had. Who is this man, you ask? He was grace embodied and love let loose. And I'll never be the same.
That small voice was more powerful than my will, my thoughts, and my faith. It ruled me, and I followed it. Most people said I betrayed him for the money, but that would be too simple. I handed him over because I couldn't know who he was for certain. There is no black and white, no 100% proof when it comes to God. Doubt is, un is an untamed weakness of the mind, and that shade of gray ate at me. Who was that man, you ask? If you would have asked me last week, I would have told you. I'm not entirely sure. Ask me on Sunday, and my answer will have changed. I'm pretty sure you can relate.
the garden, Thursday night. Then Jesus went with him to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leading them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. It all happened so fast. It was late, later than I had realized, and sleep was clinging to me like a fog I couldn't shake. I heard the crowd arrive in my dreams. At first I thought it was a crowd of people wanting Jesus to heal them. I thought selfishly to myself for just a moment, how in the world did they find us here? That's when I started to wake up. I realized the, the crowd didn't sound right. It wasn't people praising Jesus or begging for mercy. It was too quiet, far too quiet for that. And in the quiet, I could hear the clink of swords and sheets. I frankly pulled myself from sleep, shaking awake my brothers and trying to stand up quickly. I saw Judas at the front of the crowd. <coughs> what is he doing there? I thought. Maybe things will be okay after all, I thought. But I was wrong. In a split second, my whole world fell apart around me. I went from knowing my way, knowing my purpose, and knowing my plans, to standing in the wilderness alone. It happened as quickly as a thunder, summer thunderstorm and as slowly as a change in the seasons. The crowd with clubs and swords were taking Jesus. They were taking him away, and he was not fighting it. Maybe if I had stayed awake like he had, asking then, this wouldn't have happened. Maybe if we had left Jerusalem and gone back to Bethany, this wouldn't have happened. What am I supposed to tell my family? The man I have seen heal the sick and walk on water has been arrested, and the angels didn't stop it. Who is this man, you ask? He is not a criminal, that's for sure. It all happened mm -hmm. so fast. <laughs> Jesus said, 
you say so. But he, when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner from the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus the king of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. <laughs> he trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, he was calling for Elijah. At once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. The other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him, who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, 
Truly, this man was God's son. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb, which he had hewn in rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. I will never forget the sound for as long as I could. It was like a thousand thunderbolts rolled into one. And then everything went silent. Earth and time stood still. And then I watched Mary, my beloved friend, and the mother of Jesus collapse to the ground. I tried to catch her, but it was too late. I let myself fall too, and I wrapped my arms around her and just held her. And we cried, and we screamed, and we wondered. Why? Why didn't he defend himself at trial? Why did, did they have to spit on him? Why did they have to torture him? Why did they put him next to those criminals? Why didn't he come down from the cross? Why are people so afraid of him? Why did it have to end this way? Why does it hurt so bad? Why? Could it really have all been because of love? Yes. I'm certain it was all because of love. For me, and for you too.
Christ, as we pray, you will hear our prayers. Grant in our minds the same mind that is in you, that we might be vessels of your humility and grace. Lord, in your mercy, you will hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord Jesus, you emptied yourself, trading in the form of God for the form of the enslaved. Mm -hmm. We pray for the church and all her people and ministers. Form us into a church that empties itself for others and for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you were born in human likeness and found in human form. We pray for the whole human family, for the nations of the earth, and for all who live in the midst of disaster, famine, and terror. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, even after humbling yourself in your incarnation, you humbled yourself even to the point of death. We pray for our nation, our leaders, and all those charged with making decisions. May the well being of your people trump politics and the love of power. We also pray for ourselves that we might work together for the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, in your exaltation, you were given a name that is above every name. We pray in your name to those who are poor, those who are hungry, those without homes, and those who are hurting in any way, most especially the fearful, the lonely, the unemployed, and the grieving. May your love be a lantern in the dark. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you came as the Prince of Peace and turned swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. We lament the lives lost in the senselessness of gun violence and those who see no way forward except through the harm of others. Help us all that keeps us tethered to fear and self preservation at the extent of the most vulnerable. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, your humility and your love for us was so broad and deep, it cost you your life. We pray for those who we love who have died, including Debbie Chee. As you were exalted, may they rest in you in glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You humbled yourself in the manger, and you humbled yourself on the cross. And to you, O oh Lord, we bend our knee with those above and those below, to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. This supper that reminds us of the banquet of belonging and wholeness awaits that awaits us all. This table is open to all of you, for Christ is made available to all of you. Please note that after the post-communion prayer, we will hear the remaining portion of today's gospel. And then we will depart in silence, so there will not be any coffee hour or any normal greeting. I invite you to participate in to depart in silence, standing in muted awe at God's infinite love and generosity. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Please stand.
said, drop your nets and follow me. He said, let the little children come. He said, stand up from your mat, you are healed. Jesus has always been one to abide, and that has not changed. So you, my friends, are invited to this table, each and every one of us, with our doubts, our fears, our scars, our joy, our hopes, and our dreams, even our questions. We are invited to God's table. And here we will be met. Here we will be fed. Here we are given a taste of an expansive life full to the brim with love, overflowing with possibility. So come not because you can, but because, not because you must, but because you can. You are invited. This table is for you. Behold who you are. Thank you. 
Let us pray. God, we thank you that in your passion you offer forgiveness and invite us to be with you, where hunger is no more and death has no dominion. May the broken bread of life fracture our stony hearts for the sake of another world. Amen. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. Therefore command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone.